was in very good shape. Uh, we were looking at other vehicles, but uh, unfortunately they were, uh, they were quite uh, rusty. And uh, I know uh, one of the themes these days is to put a Ford in a Ford, but uh, because I worked mostly with the uh, Chevrolet engine, we took the Ford and put the uh, LS series uh, engine in it. This particular engine is a, an LS7 uh, short block with uh, LS1 uh, th uh, cylinder heads on it uh, with a carbureted intake. Uh, the carbureted intake has a throttle body on it, uh, on top of it, with uh, eight injectors. So it is uh, a fuel injected engine and the engine is coupled uh, to a six speed uh, overdrive uh, uh, 6L90E transmission with a uh, tap up, uh, tap down feature. We wanted to have all the, uh, the, the newest technology into this truck even though it looks uh, old, uh, much like its owner. This truck uh, was finished in the beginning of uh, March of 2012 and then uh, as soon as it was finished it went to uh, Toronto to be debuted at uh, Mega Speed. And then uh, at Mega Speed it won uh, three trophies and uh, one of the trophies was uh, Best Interior. And uh, it was quite, uh, quite a hit. We, had, we got uh, a lot of attention uh, at the show in uh, Toronto. And um, it has been to a few uh, cruise nights. And at uh, a cruise night uh, in uh, Cambridge and in Kitchener, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's quite a hit there. People, uh, people like it uh, because it's different. Like you, you wouldn't, just wouldn't find another vehicle like this uh, anywhere around. The interior was, was uh, done with, a, with a, a Harley influence. It has black uh, leather seats with uh, brown leather inserts, like straps in the seat. And uh, the door trim panels uh, have the same. The headliner is uh, upholstered, very uh, similar. And uh, the, the, the floor is, has, the, has buckles in it also. And uh, the door uh, panels have uh, a wallet on each uh, door uh, with, a, uh, with a chain. And uh, it's kind of neat uh, when you look in and, and see something again, like the rest of the truck, that's just different. The, the uh, car culture is uh, very popular these days. Uh, I know I started uh, back in the 60s. Okay, I had my first vehicle back there and you're never satisfied with, with a, a standard vehicle, so you have to make a little change here and a little change there. And then you get involved with uh, a friend next door or a, a buddy down the road or a fellow that's a painter, or, you know, and, and, and you use your talents. And then you come up with a little bit better vehicle and that happened uh, all, through the, you know, all through my life. And, uh, and, and it's very, very popular today because uh, there's, there's uh, hot rod shops uh, like Lowdown Hot Rods and Hitman uh, Hot Rods and Boot Hill, etc. that are out there. And uh, people have a passion uh, for an older vehicle, an older vehicle that's different, an older vehicle that's um, a, a rustro rod that looks old but has new uh, suspension in it and new brakes to make it safer and, and a new, more economical uh, engine that's uh, emission, uh, emission free. They do not uh, build the vehicles uh, the way they used to, and thank goodness for that, because uh, the new vehicles are much more reliable, much more fuel efficient, uh, perhaps on the, on the mechanical side of it, and uh, on the uh, cosmetic end of it, well, uh, I like the look of the older vehicles, but I also like the look of the, of the newer vehicles, so I guess it's just, uh, just your choice. At the present time, uh, I'm going, I enjoy uh, driving uh, the El Camino, I enjoy driving uh, the 48 uh, tow truck, and uh, we have a 1955 uh, Nomad uh, underway. Uh, I picked up this uh, 1955 uh, Nomad from a fellow in uh, Toronto, and uh, he said it's, uh, this, this vehicle is from the south. And with knowing it's from the south, I thought, well, the body will be in very good shape. And when I saw it, the quarter panels were rusted, the floor was falling out of it. And I said, John, I said, I thought you told me it was from the south. He said, it is, Bob. It's from southern New York state. Well, that's not quite uh, far enough south uh, to get rid of the rust. But uh, anyway, we put a new floor in it. And there's new quarter panels uh, on it. Uh, my friend Peter in Elmira is looking after uh, that for me. And uh, within the next year or two, uh, we should have a very nice uh, driver. Uh, in the uh, 55 Nomad. Yes, uh, hot rodding, uh, car building is an ongoing uh, process 
and it just seems to go on and on and, and, and whatever vehicle, some fellows like to stick with the, six, the first generation uh, Camaro, 6789 Camaro. And there are other people, uh, like myself, that uh, have mid-year vehicles like the El Camino and, and, uh, and then back in, into the 50s with the Nomad and then back into the 40s uh, like the 48. So uh, I guess it's, uh, you know, whatever comes along and you look at it, you like it, you start building it. I'm Bob Hilt and these are my Radical Rides. Thanks Bob, awesome trucks. It's time now for our Loyalty Luxury Auto Tech Tip. Here's Ed Metcalf. Anyone can appreciate having a genuine classic car in the driveway, but would you let your son or daughter go for a drive in it knowing that it doesn't handle like today's modern cars? In today's Tech Tip, we're gonna discuss the modifications that can be made to these old cars to make them drive like a more modern car. Here we have the original steering gearbox out of our 1967 Ford Mustang. We've replaced this unit because it has play. The flaw of this design is the worm gear technology. At highway speed, the driver must make constant corrections with the steering wheel to keep the car from wandering. To remedy this problem, we've replaced the old steering system with a more modern power rack and pinion setup. This upgrade dramatically improves the car's handling and makes it much more enjoyable to drive. Drum brakes have far less stopping capability than power disc brakes. On our Mustang here, we had drum brakes on all four wheels. The driver had to press very hard on the pedal to stop the car. In this case, we removed the drum brakes all the way around and replaced them with power vented disc brakes. This allows the driver to stop the car with far less effort and in a shorter distance. Making these modifications will make your classic car drive more like today's modern cars. And that's today's tech tip. We'll see you next time. Thanks, Ed. Don't go away. Radical Rides will be right back with a sport compact you don't want to miss. Welcome back to Radical Rides. Clean lines and subtle modifications are the theme on Kevin Brasso's Chevy S10. But as we're about to find out, he might not be done with his truck just yet. I drive a, a 1997 S10 pickup. Uh, I purchased it uh, three months out of college. I bought it in November. Um, I, when I picked it up, I, I couldn't even drive it. It was stick. I ended up having my father drive it from the auto shop right to a barn for storage. Um, sat there for the winter. It's never seen winter over the past 15 years. And uh, a few years after, I ended up bringing it into a shop, Ultimate Customs in Ajax, and got it completely redone, taken apart into pieces, repainted, pulled back together with a bunch of uh, cosmetic uh, custom parts. Um, leading from the front end, uh, the Frenched in uh, bumper, uh, fiberglass hood, wiper cowl, the mirrors, shaved door handles, shaved gas cap, um, and then right to the rear end where I got the, the rear step shaved off with a, a flush uh, roll pan and shaved the uh, uh, tailgate handle. The idea was to try to make it as sleek as possible and uh, so it's a consistent color from, from one end to the other. Back in the late 90s, um, I got into uh, the, the mini trucks as, uh, you know, as, as the height of its uh, popularity. And, um, you know, for me it was, uh, I've always had, had uh, an interest in uh, the muscle cars, the sports cars. So this was the, the affordable sports car for a young guy to have a, a two-seater that you could put in a really decent motor in. Um, has, you know, two uh, back-wheel drive and the insurance was, uh, you know, affordable rather than having a, a two-door uh, sports car. So that, that's what brought me into this, uh, into the trucking scene. At the beginning, I've been involved in quite a few shows um, back in the early 2000s after I, I got most of the customization done. Uh, lately, it's, it's been sitting in the garage. Uh, you know, my big picture intent is, uh, you know, this car is not going anywhere. Uh, you know, I always see it as my retirement project for in the future to do more stuff to it. I'd love to uh, put in a nice big V8 into it, uh, uh, chop the roof off. And there's so many little things that you can do with it. Uh, it has a full body frame, so there's, uh, the, you know, the potential is endless. 
Well, I, it, you know, it's interesting when I bought it, it was so, it, it was pretty affordable. I bought it for 14000 off the lot, no AC, no, uh, no radio, no nothing. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it, I've been lucky to have uh, this as my summer driver and, and, uh, and a winter beater for, you know, the rest of the year. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's hard to come up with the, <laughs> the extra money to do the, the fun stuff, but, uh, you know, it's enjoyable in the long run. Definitely, it would be more economical to take an existing vehicle that uh, you know has been around, and, and there's so much stuff out there in the scene right now that you can get for parts and so on to, to do those modifications. The process to to do the modifications for the the shaved door handles and the gas cap um, really it was uh, you know they when the work was done uh, the, the sheet the sheet metal work was sandblasted right down to bare metal and. Uh, you know, panels or, or filler pieces uh, brought in, welded in, um, and then uh, uh, sanded out and, and repainted, um, which gives it the clean look. Yeah, shaving the door handles and shaving the gas caps is, is very common. Um, you know, it, uh, it gives a clean look so you don't see uh, anything from the, you know, the front bumper to the back. Um, it, it streamlines the color right through without any imperfections uh, along the way. When you lower, the, the truck is lowered three inches in the front and roughly about two in the back, so it does drop a little bit front heavy, but uh, um, I went with a static drop just because one, it's, it's much more economical. Um, it does change the drivability. It, it, I always see it, it drives like a go-kart now, and, which is fun on the road, especially on the highway. It seems like you're really low to the ground. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not uh, you know, a vehicle to go pick up wood or lumber from Home Depot anymore, uh, which is okay with me. It's, it's, it's like a car now, for sure. On the interior, I uh, swapped out. I used to have a bench seat. I swapped it out with a Blazer bucket seats. Uh, also took out some of the panel pieces and, and painted it to match the exterior. Uh, put in a sound system pretty well. It's, uh, it's one of those stereo systems that give you a full body massage while you're driving. It's fun. Uh, it's very popular to have uh, you know, a stereo system, a decent stereo system with your, your mini truck. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's neat to have. Under the hood, it's, it's still stock. It, it just has a four banger, but uh, really cheap on gas, you know, 50 bucks get, gets me almost five to 600 kilometers, so that's convenient right now. But yeah, the big picture is definitely to put in a bigger motor. Um, you know, there's no rush. To, I'm just waiting for the motor to die. <laughs> Yeah, the stock wheels, it almost gives it like a, almost say a retro look in a sense, right? Um, you know, ultimately I like to get something nicer, some fat big tires uh, when I change over with the big V8, but uh, um, you know, it does give it uh, you know, a clean look, uh, consistent from back to front. I guess when I first bought the truck, a lot of people thought it was like the, ex the next extreme because that was before uh, uh, I believe it was either 98 or 99 when uh, the S10 Extreme came out and uh, a lot of people thought that this was a vehicle that was purchased right off the lot as is and, and was, didn't realize that it was custom because uh, the customizations are so subtle. Um, so that was pretty neat when I first got the, the, the work done. Um, you know, a lot of people uh, uh, were very surprised with it. They thought it was some, you know, concept car or or, the, or an extreme vehicle that they haven't seen just yet. My name is Kevin Brousseau and this is my Radical Ride. Well, there are three trucks that are all capable of hauling asphalt. I'm Ali Gunn and I'll see you next time on Radical Rides.
On today's show, a return to the exotics with a twist. This is Radical Rides. Brent Lavallee has a collection that would be the envy of any car enthusiast. And today, he's going to share a small sample with us. Hi, my name is Brent Lavallee, and uh, I've got several radical rides that we can play with. I've uh, actually been into cars for years. My father always had some cars around the farm, and I was able to play with them. And before long, I got my mechanics license, and we were able to play with a lot of different cars. Originally I was into the older stuff, but lately the new stuff has come so far and so fast and so reliable that it's just, it's a full 360 to market. So now I've got a lot of preferences in the Porsches, the Lamborghinis, the Corvettes, the Vipers. We uh, still play with some of the older cars because I wanted my daughter to learn about the old stuff. A lot of the new stuff that I'm referring to is the fuel injection, the knock sensors, so the fuel can be a little bit less of a desired grade. The car will still run functionally. The way that it sticks to the road, the engineering, the there's no longer a little bit of play in the front end. It's tight. It's just a pleasure to drive. Ice cold air conditioning. The Porsches are fantastic because a lot of this new stuff, they don't drive in the winter, so every bolt comes out. So it's actually a pleasure to work on than a beat up Volkswagen that uh, nothing comes apart. And uh, they're just a great vehicle. The Porsche we have over here is a 2008 997. So it's originally the 911, but it's actually called the 997 because of the twin turbos. This car here is an AWE package, which is pushing just about 700 horsepower, which is bigger intercoolers, bigger turbos, and chipped. This car also features a GT3 suspension, which means it's lowered and it's ready for a racetrack. This car is fully street legal, can be driven every single day to work, and it is absolutely a pleasure to drive. It holds the road, it also features a sport chrono package so you can actually watch yourself uh, go to work and see how long it takes you to get there. With these cars, I find that a lot of them are just basically, you have to stick with it. So not every car is perfect, not every car is gonna be get you down the road. You just have to not get frustrated and stick with it until you get it figured out. And you gotta try a lot of different stuff. The, uh, I go to a lot of auctions to look at cars, I go to a lot of people's houses. I find a lot of cars that have been sitting for years and years and we get them out, actually start driving them and we start enjoying them. And once they start running and driving, they're a real pleasure. And there's nothing like seeing the look on somebody's face after you've driven the car for six months or so or two months and they turn the key and actually see their car that they once had is actually drivable. Well, our collecting habits, the problem with us is that once we get all the bugs out of it, we're very satisfied. Unfortunately, sometimes we do end up selling the cars. Collecting habits are a little bit of everything. Like some weeks we'll have a Viper for a year or two years, and other times we'll have it for a week because there's just nothing we can do with it. Right now, this Porsche, we're having a lot of fun with it because there's just so much stuff you can do with it, between setting different alignments on the caster camber and just making it right. I used to think that everything had to be original in cars, and in the old stuff, I was brought up that way. An original car, is great to look at, but it's not real nice to drive. So I've realized that by put adding disc brakes, power steering, and adding a lot of creature comforts, that this old stuff can be a lot of fun and drive like the new stuff. So the last few years, our focus in the older cars has changed a lot in making the cars drivable, and making people turn the key. I helped the guy out with an older Mustang that he's owned since high school, and after reconditioning it, he put more miles on it last year than he did the entire 25 years of owning it. And seeing that smile on his face is worth it. This Porsche is real good to go out of the gate, but because it was customized, you still have to tweak it. We, uh, right now I'm gonna have to put a Sax 2.5 clutch in it because under this kind of power, it doesn't hold up at high RPMs. So that'll be tweaking. Also, we're gonna tweak the alignment a little bit more and programming, getting the navigation set up, figuring out all the little switches. You have to be able to explain to somebody if they're ever to buy a car down the road, how to run everything and to know that it's a good car and that you're not just selling or moving something or toying with something that isn't satisfactory. The Porsche here has really refined itself. What they've done is they've taken the original 911 and they just keep refining it and refining it and refining it. They don't keep redesigning, they don't keep remanufacturing. The level of Porsche quality has absolutely out of this world. 
Everything is tight, it's drivable, it's reliable, and it's just a real pleasure. Some of the new ones actually have what's called launch control, where you hit a button on the dash, you put your foot on the brake and your foot on the gas, and the car launches itself out of the hole. The Viper's always been a very basic car, but it's just raw power. It is just a no bars hold, power, 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 and there's not a lot of creature comforts in them. The Viper is a good car. It's a fantastic car because there's not a lot to go wrong. Most of the earlier ones never even had power windows. They had nothing. They, they're just a very basic car. And a lot of the car collectors, the people that all wanted a 67 Corvette or 69 Camaro, have all resorted to the Viper because it is a newer style fuel injected car that they can drive. That's very drivable. The Porsche is a lot more money than the Viper, and the Porsche is also has a lot more creature comforts. It has, they call it a two plus two, where you can actually has two very small back seats, but it's not really for the average person to sit back there. The Porsche is a fantastic car. It's, but it's not, it's, it's four wheel drive. The Viper's two wheel drive. The Porsche has all the navigations, the sport chronos, the you know, Xenon headlights. In the newer Vipers, you can get the Xenon headlights, but not the older ones. I don't really have a favorite car at this point because it seems like the sky's the limit. And what I have and what we get to play with is what sometimes what somebody wants. So we're very fortunate that way. And the sky is the limit. Some of these cars now, the Lamborghinis, they're pushing 1600 horsepower in them, which is just phenomenal. Some of the Vipers out there, like I got a customer with over a thousand horsepower in his Viper. That's a lot of fun when you get that kind of power and it's reliable. He can drive it every day to work. So we're very fortunate in this, in the role we are in, whereas we get to play with a lot of different cars and make it right. But it's never easy. It's, there's such fantastic cars on the market. They're such reliable. They're, the engineering, the NDT, which is non-destructive testing of parts. You can actually send axle shafts out and get them checked and see if they're gonna blow up because there's a, there's a crack in it or there's a bad machining or there's problems. And uh, just the flow benches. I mean, the power in these engines in the last 10 years is just phenomenal. There's engines I put in a guy's car 10 years ago and the same engine, they can reflow it and get an extra 100 horsepower on some of the big blocks. The problem is every year they release a new vehicle and the newer seems to be better and greater. I've been very fortunate that every car in my bucket list I've been able to somehow get a hold of and drive and play with through one of our contacts and customers and we've just been just meeting the right people at the right time. It's meeting actual real car guys that actually turn the key in their car. They actually drive them. I mean a lot of these guys actually take their cars to Mossport. They'll run around the track. They actually go off and, and race them and there's a lot of days where it's fantastic. It's not just a guy opens his garage, rolls back a cover and says this is a fantastic car. It's actually guys turning the keys, getting out, going to cruise nights, going to different places and enjoying their cars. Brent isn't the only one in his family with a passion for cars. After the break, we'll meet his brother, Chad. Welcome back. The Lavalie clan shares a special need for speed. Here's Chad to fill us in. This is my Lamborghini. It's a 2007 Gallardo um, convertible or Spider. Uh, it's the only one in the world that's made in Rosso Andromeda, which is the uh, bright red with a six-speed uh, transmission in the convertible. Um, the standard uh, red in the Gallardo is actually a dark red, almost a maroon. So this was a special order uh, car um, I like red, it really stands out, it's, it's quite uh, bright and it's also quite unique. Uh, I also wanted the six speed, a lot of the um, Gallardos and Murcielagos were made with the e-gear or the automatic. I wanted more of a true sports or exotic car feel having the six speed and shifting the gears. Everybody when I was growing up always used to have the Countach on their wall as a poster, it was the dream car uh, for everyone. So I actually do have a Countach as well, a four valve uh, carbureted car, one of only seven in the world so it's a great car it's a little harder to drive though um, the windows uh, don't go all the way down there's less visibility in the back so what I actually wanted was a open top roadster which you could drive and cruise on a nice sunny day and I think the Gardo um, is the um, best uh, open top uh, roadster in the world 
I've had some Ferraris in the past and other Lamborghinis. I've had Diablo, Diablo Roadster, Mercy Lago. Um, the Lamborghini is uh, really wild. It's just the uh, most exotic car out there. It's where you drive by and people say, wow, oh my gosh. Um, other cars do that, but not to the extent of the Lamborghini. Uh, also, I find Lamborghinis are a lot rarer. Um, you're lucky in your lifetime to even see one go by on the road. The Ferruccio Lamborghini was the original um, developer of Lamborghini. He actually bought Ferraris and he was a tractor builder. But he went into Enzo Ferrari's office and said, uh, you know, I've got some problems with my Ferrari, here's some improvements, and I don't think Ferrari really listened to him, so he actually built his own car. And it started out as more of a coupe, uh, more of a sedan, sort of a driver's car day to day. And then they came up with the uh, first uh, real exotic version was the Mira V12, and built in the late 60s and early 70s. From then they went to the all-out Countach, which is the most famous, I think, of Lamborghinis. And they built those from the early 70s up until 1990. Um, then it was the Chrysler ownership days where they built the uh, Diablo. And then Diablos went into Diablo Roadsters in the late 90s. And from then it went into Mercy Lagos and Gallardos. I think they get more uh, drivable, um, more reliable, um, but it's just a different feel. It just depends what you what you want. Well, everybody's looking at you, waving, beeping their horns. Um, just it feels great. Just the power, just the uh, noise, the sound of the engine. Um, if you're having a bad day and you drive a Lamborghini, you feel great. It's just like um, somebody took a syringe of adrenaline and pumped it into your thigh. Other people, when they see it as well, it makes them feel good. When they see a Lamborghini go by, you know, it's like, wow, what's that? What's that uh, great thing? And I think it pumps people up as well, uh, as long as they're driven responsibly. Yeah, we do go on some exotic car runs occasionally, so we'll get a bunch of um, other exotic owners together and we'll go for a nice tour out in the country. Um, stop. We always have a lot of stops along the way, so we'll stop for a coffee. And then there's always crowds of people that come and they want to talk cars. Where did you get it? You know, how much does it cost? How much is insurance? So we make quite a few stops along the way and also have a nice cruise, talk to other owners. Um, it's not a great day-to-day -day driver, or a, it's not a great uh, grocery getter or um, go out for dinner car, because the problem is when you stop for dinner, you come out and there'll be 10 people sitting on it and taking pictures and things. So, which is good and bad. It's good for the attention, and, and, but you um, just have to watch scratches. There are a lot of owners that like to get together and go for, for runs, um, like I said, out in the country and things. So there are people who soup up exotics as well, like they did with the muscle cars, twin turbos and uh, superchargers and <clears throat> a, lot of, a lot of things like that as well. So there is a culture souping them up and there is also a, a culture of um, drivers as well. You always want to own something different once in a while and you know, I think um, Flamborghini comes out with some other cars, they just came out with the Aventador kind of neat so once maybe when they come down in price a little bit on the used market I might pick one of those up. Uh, I am a collector because I look for some of the rare cars like my Countach is one of seven 48 valve carbureted cars. They're, they only snuck a few of them into the, uh, North America before the EPA shut them down and then the subsequent Countaches were fuel injected and less powerful. As well this Gallardo is one of one with the, uh, the only Rosso Andromeda bright red six speed convertible. So I'm a collector from that perspective and more of an enthusiast than someone who just enjoys the car, enjoys driving um, for what they are. And uh, so I think I'm a bit of both. I think it's, uh, it's very fast and very wild. I live a fairly fast paced life, I'm very busy. I'm a physician at the hospital, at St. Mary's Hospital, so we're quite busy there and go, go, go and it's nice to be able to come out and get into a car like this and, and relax and, uh, and feel the power and um, go a little fast if you need to. Yeah, it definitely is a stress reliever. Just getting into it and knowing at the end of the day there's some enjoyment um, in addition to you know, looking after patients and things, which is enjoyable as well. There's some, a different kind of enjoyment at the end of the day. Uh, the wife likes cars as well. Um, we were kind of busy with four young kids. So um, she doesn't have time to go along with me and I don't have as much time to drive as much as I used to either. Um, I have one, uh, the Countach is actually in the basement of my house. The uh, end wall to the garage comes out and I actually can put it right in front of the fireplace. 
So um, she'd like to kind of get that out of there into the garage. But uh, other than that, uh, she likes cars as well. And encourages me to, uh, you know, follow my, uh, my interest. Our little guy, on his first day of school, um, put his lunch into the uh, car because he figured that my wife and I, each of the car, the Lamborghini should be his. So he thought maybe he should drive that to, uh, to school. So, so they like cars as well. They're a little bit young still to fully appreciate them though. I'm Chad Lavalley and this is my Radical Ride. Coming up after the break, perhaps the most radical rides this show has ever seen. Don't go away. Well, I'm back again and I have two other Radical Rides that I'm very proud of. This is a 1957 BMW Isetta. It is 298 cc, so they call it the Isetta 300, because it rounds up to 300. It's got a four-speed standard transmission. This thing has restored every nut and bolt with my loving family and a couple of friends. The helicopter is a kit. It's a home-built rotorway Talon A600. It was, uh, the kit came in in January of this year and well, you can see we're flying it already and it's uh, just a ton of fun. This 1957 Isetta is very hard to find. There used to be lots of them around, but it seems there's not many around right now and it's a, a neat car. It's actually featured on another show. My daughter was seeing it on the show and she said, Dad, I'd love to work on one of those. So I started looking and looking and eventually I found one sitting in a, bank, in a barn in Maine that had been there since 1966. This car was all original, very solid, but it needed cosmetic work everywhere. So we tore it right down to the frame and rebuilt absolutely every nut and bolt, including engine, transaxle, tires, brakes, instruments, wiring, everything. The process was about uh, three months. We worked on it every night until uh, my daughter went to bed. A couple of my friends helped too, and it was a uh, the whole car came apart in about seven hours, but unfortunately it took two and a half months to put back together. It was, uh, we had it all soda blasted, so it was down to bare metal, so we were able to see if there was any uh, repair material in the body. It was a very solid body with only one spot that uh, had a dent before it was filled. We had it all hammered out, straightened up, and uh, we went to work on the frame. My daughter was very much involved with everything on this car because it's very small. She actually got to change all her own tires. She got to do a lot of the brakes on it. She got to help with a lot of the stuff. She, uh, the one night I had to leave and I came back and I come home, she's actually reading a wiring diagram and wiring most of the car. So she's actually thoroughly enjoyed working on this vehicle. Well, we're just get, starting to put some miles on it now. The plans are is actually in the trailer, this car fits under the tail boom of the helicopter. So if we go to an air show or somewhere, we actually have something to drive around and get coffee in. So it's kind of a really neat car as for that spec because it fits under the tail boom. Well, at this point, it's just going to be a hobby car, and the problem is that uh, every time you restore one, you learn more and more and more, so we're not quite sure what she's going to end up with when, in another five years when she turns 16. This car is actually very drivable when it's all set up right. It just takes a bit of time to get all the little points set and the carburetor set and the drivability, the alignment, uh, tie rods. And because it's old school, there's not a lot of precision fitting on any of it, so it's, it takes quite a while to get it set up. But once it is set up, it's a very, very fun car to drive. They actually have a bigger model called an A600, and the 600 would actually have a door at the back and has two seats. This is the A300, so it only has one single door at the front that opens up, and the steering wheel, everything tilts forward to allow access in. Now, in order to make it legal to drive on the roads in Canada and North America, they actually have a sunroof. Well, that's not a sunroof, that's actually an escape hatch. So if you rear end the car in front of you or you get sandwiched, you climb out the roof. This probably isn't the safest. It only does about 78 kilometers an hour wide open. And, uh, but for the city and going around and getting coffee and just driving around, it's just about as much fun as you can have in a car. It's easy to park, easy to drive. Well, about 12 years ago, I was starting to get a little bit uh, bored with cars after you do so many restorations and build enough cars that I wanted to try something a little bit different. 
So I had found a helicopter and restored the helicopter. And then this year, with my daughter flying with me so much, and uh, wife and uh, other people, I decided to order another kit, and we built a complete brand new helicopter. Well, this helicopter is, is actually registered as a full-fledged helicopter. It, uh, it's a Talon A600. You order the kit, and the company's in Arizona. They actually have a flight training center there that you can go there. There's also flight training units all over Kitchener. There's one in Kitchener, there's one in St. Thomas, there's some in Toronto. So there is places you can go get your license when it is, it is done. But you do have to set it up, build it, tie it down, and, and actually fly it for the very first time yourself. There's nobody out there that seems to want to get in your home-built helicopter. I try to use this one or two times a week, this one here. This one just flies amazing. It's, uh, it's done very well. It's a fun machine. It's smooth. It's fast. You can land just about anywhere you want other than in the city. I use it for commuting sometimes. A lot of my customers are out in the country. They live on farms or they have a place like that that I will actually land in their backyard and go work on their car, appraise their car, or you know, just go visit them. It makes for quite an entrance. This one actually this year we took to the world's largest air show, Oshkosh, Wisconsin. We actually ended up placing second. We got the Silver Lindy. The Silver Lindy is the quality of your build, the quality of your helicopter and they all compete and the judges from around the United States come in and they judge your helicopter, the quality of your nuts, of bolts and everything turned the proper way and the safety wires and the rigidity of it. This helicopter is just under the price of a new Corvette ZR1 by the time it's all said and done. So it's uh, very, very affordable. It's, it's just a lot of fun. This one actually has all glass cockpit panels so you can take a little SD card out of your glass panel and you can put it in your computer at home and you reconfigure all your gauges and you can put little cartoons on it and you can do just about anything you want with it. So on this one here you almost have to be a computer programmer to figure out most of it so I did need a little assistance with some of that. I've assisted a few people in helicopters and bringing them into Canada. I don't do that as a business because it's my last hobby that I haven't turned into a business that I really enjoy. We've assisted 14 people with their rotaway helicopters that have actually set them up, done the micro vibration analysis, and test flown it for the first time. The ride in this is just phenomenal. It's actually, I've been able to put on frictions, and I've got a kind of a homemade cruise control in this one, so it's uh, really just a great experience. Um, we, we actually fly them. We go through the entire flight manual, and we practice all maneuvers available to helicopters. Every month, at least, I practice all maneuvers. Everything from going up 500 feet, shutting the engine off, to you know, slope landings, confined areas. I mean, we, we make sure that we know how to fly the helicopter. As for the views and the thrill of flying this helicopter, there's just not much like it. When you're up there and you have no doors on, you're hanging out, you can just, you know, feeling the air coming through. This one cruises at 95 miles an hour, so you're doing basically 150 kilometers an hour. So when you want to get somewhere, you get there in a hurry. And there's just no feeling in the world like it. I have a lot of friends, I kind of got a waiting list of people that I have to give rides to in it. <laughs> My name is Brent LaValle and these are my two radical rides. Time definitely flies when you're having fun. I'm Allie Gunn. See you next time on Radical Rides.